Okay. Uh, so you see my screen now? It's shared? Yes, yes. Okay. Perfect, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so thanks a lot, Diane, for the nice uh, invitation to this workshop and for the nice introduction. Um, yes, today my, my talk uh, has, uh, I noticed my talk uh, title is slightly different um, feeling to it from the other uh, talks. It's uh, quite concrete. It's related to cone size dependence of, of jet uh, spectra in heavy ion collisions. But, um, um, my, the outline of my talk will involve uh, actually many um, uh, a slight detour <laughs> toward this phenomenological application, which is on the last point. Uh, it will involve a little bit of a re a recap of what are QCD jets, and what, uh, how we um, use them, how we compute them. Um, it will uh, involve uh, talking about... Uh, just one second. That's a nice interruption. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, this is like, has to happen, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any problem. Uh, and then, uh, so we'll talk about the uh, the vacuum and medium, uh, merging of the vacuum and medium evolution. So we, we need to take into account both things and I will discuss in concretely what, what that means. And then uh, finally, um, I will talk about um, uh, quenching, uh, how we deal with quenching in an in improved and precise way, uh, which is something called the improved opacity. Um, and I have many slides. I hope I managed to, to get to the end. Um, I will start skipping. <laughs> Sorry about that. So let's start with the structure of QCD jets. So uh, we know that in QCD, we have uh, famously the uh, uh, soft and collinear divergences um, when we have uh, radiation, so one to two processes. Uh, and these, uh, these um, the divergences basically lead to the fact that multiple emissions uh, occur when we have a large scale, uh, when we have a high energy jet or, or a large transverse momentum jet or something like this. Uh, and in the end, um, the reason why these multiple emissions occur and we get these kind of structures that, as I drew out there, is because the phase space compensates the smallness of alpha s in the splitting. Um, and the phase space is particularly large if the PT of the jet is large and or the transfer amount of, of the jet is large and the cone size is large. Uh, as long as these scales are bigger than the lambda QCD parameter or hadronization scale, um, then you have a large probability for multiple emissions and you have to, um, well, you have a large probability for an emission. That means simply that you have to resum multiple emissions. And these, uh, these kind of uh, theoretical uh, ideas simply show up on the detector uh, images as these kind of collimated sprays of, uh, of particles and energy. Uh, so this zeroth order, this is basically what a jet is. However, um, you can immediately see here from this image that that it's it's slightly up to the experimentator or or slightly up to the uh, to the um, to the spectator to, that sees this image to decide what is actually belong which, which which radiation here belongs to the jet and which doesn't belong to the jet and that's definitely an issue of um, an agreement between the experiment and the and the theory that has to has to be uh, made. So for instance, uh, typically we define a spectrum with this uh, jet cone R. If we go back to the previous image, it would simply mean that we, we simply uh, put a cone uh, in, the, in our detector or on this plane uh, and, uh, and, and capture part of these are the radiations will be inside the cone. And for instance, this lower uh, green line would be out of the cone, for instance. And then one can immediately uh, compute, and that was done already many years ago, to try to compute um, how much energy actually falls out of that cone. And it turns out that that is also a significant amount and it scales like this log over one over R. So the R is the jet cone. Uh, and as we can see from these images, the amount of, of energy or transverse momentum actually lost uh, outside of the cone scales like a log over one over R. And this simply means that um, the, there, is, uh, there is radiation going from the hard scale of the jet, which is roughly of the order of PT of the jet down to the jet scale, which is roughly PT times R. Uh, and in between these two, uh, these two scales, there is also a DGLAP evolution. 
Um, just as a side note, before we go on to that point, uh, is to say that also jets can uh, can get energy, can can get energy even in this is vacuum. This is PP collisions. Uh, these are PP collisions, and here the jet can get energy just simply from from the underlying event that basically fills the the detector with uniform radiation, roughly in a certain rapidity range, uh, and then you capture basically a proportion of that uh, PT. This is just to say that some of these elements will, will reappear in the context of a medium. Um, so, however, so these logs of one over R uh, were realized that they uh, they basically contribute co con they contribute they 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 can be visualized as, as simply radiations at large angles uh, that uh, that uh, a certain parton uh, produces and that doesn't is not captured by the jet cone and thus that energy actually is lost. From the jet and and um, the spectrum of jets uh, with a certain um, uh, so in the end you can you can you can write down a so-called microjet spectrum which is basically the distribution of these microjets is given by this uh, density f here f jet so you have a part on i and you start out building a jet from this part on i um, and that uh, is uh, given this evolution equation for this distribution function is basically given. By this, uh, by a simple DG lab evolution equation, and uh, that leads to the fact that basically you have a suppression factor for small R jets. Small R jets are simply uh, not any more just pure partons, or not direct proxies of pure partons, but they are a certain. Uh, you have to convolve these uh, through a certain radiation process to get access to these initial hard partons. Uh, and these 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 things have been developed in the recent years, both in the in the QCD uh, side and then also the sketch side. And now uh, we are turning our attention to the medium, and in the medium we have basically um, a following problem that typically the spectrum of in AA collisions scaled by number of of, of uh, collisions happening uh, according to the Glauber model or or, or something else is typically suppressed with respect to the PP spectrum. So here I just show a, a cartoon of that. And the interpretation of this suppression is that there is a momentum shift. So a particle occupying a certain momentum bin in, uh, from, from in the hard spectrum coming out of the hard uh, collisions, uh, partonic collisions is basically lo losing its energy delta P and it's shifted down to another position in the, in the spectrum. And this leads to, if you take the uh, ratio of these two, um, in, in a sketch, uh, it would simply mean that the, the ratio of these two uh, spectra would give you a, a so-called nuclear modification factor, which is smaller than one. And this is a famous result already from Rick. Uh, and at CMS, we have uh, a, well, uh, a lot of information about this. So um, now I show you the charge hadrons, REA. And also there is um, the, um, the jets are jet REA. Um, so there's a significant suppression at, uh, at of these uh, of these yields of producing charged hadrons at high PT and also jets at high PT. However, in the two problems, uh, there are slightly different types of uh, tools that that are needed. Um, sorry, uh, jumped uh, ahead here. So, what we typically um, uh, will use is somehow a generic uh, generic uh, object. Um, which is um, um, related to um, the probability of losing a certain amount of energy, um, whether it's a parton or, for instance, a jet or something else. So these you just have to keep in mind exactly what we're talking about. So let's first stick to the um, concept of the parton. Let's say we produce a, a hard parton. And then we uh, will resum soft emissions of this parton. And let's do that using a Poisson process. In fact, that DG lab evolution that I was just describing uh, in the vacuum of, of a, a hard parton emitting large angle gluons out of the jet cone is very similar to this process. Really, it's a very close to Poissonian process. In this moment, the DG lab should be very similar to a Poissonian process. But in this case, the spectrum di the omega simply means um, the medium induced radiation um, caused by a fast particle. So now in the ID omega, uh, in principle, I will include only the medium induced additional 
medium induced radiation coming on top of the vacuum radiation. Uh, and this is, goes a little bit back to the uh, previous talk uh, when it comes to uh, heavy quartz, uh, as we said, we typically focus on elastic processes that we discussed here. I will mainly focus on the radiative processes, but at the end, I will also show how to include elastic processes. So this probability distribution here, I just written it out for one gluon emission. It just, it's a, it's a and I, by construction, it is a probability. So if I integrate over epsilon, which is the amount of energy being radiated, I get back one. Uh, and in the end, you can iterate this to have n gluon emission and arbitrary number of gluon emission, of course, uh, using a Poissonian and Amzans. So, and how does this actually affect the spectrum itself? So if the sigma is a partonic spectrum, I would just simply put this partonic probability of losing energy next to convolve it together with the spectrum. Where now my initial vacuum spectrum in, in uh, quotation marks vacuum, meaning the hard spectrum that would occur in the same way in vacuum in a medium, it's shifted by an amount PT plus epsilon instead of just being an epsilon. So in, in the end, we see that this is a, this is a, a convolution. However, since, since the spectrum is steeply falling and since PT is much bigger than the typical epsilon value, typically PT can range up to a TV the, at LHC and, and epsilon would be of the order of a typical um, gluon energy in this distribution, right? In this, uh, in this distribution, which we will actually show later that is pretty small of the order of a couple of GVs. And since the steep, uh, spectrum is steeply falling with an index M, you basically can do an ansatz, uh, you can do an approximation, sorry, uh, which is basically uh, approximating it as we do in the second uh, equality here on the second approximation. So it's approximately the vacuum spectrum times a factor, a quenching factor, which we call Q, which is basically a Laplace transform of the probability of losing energy, probability distribution P. Uh, P is also often called the quenching weight. So this turns out to be a very good approximation both at Rick and LHC uh, kinematics because of the typical smallness of, of a typical value of epsilon and also of a typical, typically a large value of N. Uh, and a large and a, and a large value of uh, of PT. So somehow um, these these uh, approximations go go hand in hand. Of course, you can do this better. You can you can either you know treat it fully as a convolution, uh, or you can you can also expand it in higher orders and and co compute corrections here. So this is an improved improvable approximation. And it's important here to say that the P the, the distribution and uh, the probability of losing energy is includes fluctuations. Um, in it. However, now when we, so this is typically the, 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 the thing that was directly extended to hadron. So a hadron comes from uh, the fragmentation of the parton and typically um, already 20 years ago, people were thinking, oh, a parton will, will basically fragment, will first lose certain energy in the plasma. And then at long distances, it, it will fragment down to the non-perturbative scale uh, and hit the, the hadronization scale. And then it will just become a hadron. Uh, however, this is not true for jets. Uh, there are two new tools are being needed. So first of all, um, uh, first of all, and, and this is important for the phenomenology, phenomenology. We need to know how much energy uh, and how does the energy flow in and out of the cone? Because you have in the jet physics, you have the concept of the cone instead of just measuring a single particle, you're measuring a collection of particles, as we said before. So, and, and in principle, then going back one step, you can even say that jets are multi-parton objects with a space-time structure. So you have to make a decision, how many partons actually on which level are contributing to the energy loss. And um, it's not as simple as just saying that the whole jet is being quenched or all the partons separately are being quenched. You have to make a decision, informed decision about how many of the partons and which stage of their, let's say fragmentation process are being affected by, by the medium. And in this case, many existing uh, Monte Carlo's are, Monte Carlo programs exist. Uh, uh, however, you need uh, analytical approaches to guide, the, guide them further. And we'll show a little bit um, why. So you can imagine one, two limits here in these images. One is that you basically the whole, the medium sees the jet as just one object. So all the part on sitting in within a corner are not being resolved by the medium and the medium simply sees the jet as one color charge. 
In this case, you will have one emitter. It's a simple argument that the jet will just behave as one parton. However, in another scenario, you can imagine that the medium will resolve a certain number of emitters inside of the jet, for instance, n emitters. In this case, the quenching would obviously be larger because you have more color charges and you have um, and you have simply, uh, then you will generate more radiation and also more scattering, so you will lose more energy. Uh, and this was realized already on the level of the Monte Carlo that this, this uh, um, for instance, the uh, dual Monte Carlo and also the hybrid Monte Carlo, that this, is, this plays an important role. And these fluctuations come on top of these medium fluctuations, for instance, coming from the different path lengths, uh, coming from the probability of simply losing energy or not, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we deal with this vacuum, vacuum radiation in the medium? Uh, first of all, it was addressed uh, in the context of antenna radiation. So you can imagine that instead of producing one pardon in the medium, you produce two pardons directly in the medium uh, and they propagate together at small angles and uh, like a dipole basically. Uh, and um, you can imagine how this would mod be modified by, by medium effects. And there, the new important ingredient is that you would induce in interference terms, you would induce interferences between these two objects. Uh, and that has not yet been discussed, right, in, in what I was saying. So this, this is a new component, the interference component. So what we did, for instance, a couple of years back is to try to compute um, the energy loss of, uh, of these kind of two objects. So let's say you have a, a parton. Within a formation time, it will split into two new partons. Um, and this can be seen as uh, in the large MC limit as basically a, a total charge, you know, the, yellow, uh, the red charge here, um, propagating from zero to, to, the, to the detector. And also at some point, it will, you will, it will appear a new dipole um, um, structure, a color singlet structure, uh, which will also open up and, and propagate. And it turns out that uh, how does this, how the system will lose energy, turns out to have a very factorized and nice interpretation. So first of all, the, the energy loss or this quenching factor from these two, from this particular process of one to two, uh, has basically this factorized structure that is basically the energy loss of the total charge, the red, uh, basically the red charge here. And then uh, a singlet uh, probably, uh, energy uh, quenching factor, which basically contains a delay effect. So there are two time scales now in this image. One is called the formation time. That's when the splitting happens, and it is very short because this is a high energy splitting, high momentum uh, splitting. Uh, and then there is a decoherence time. So the decoherence time is basically the the time when the medium starts resolving actually this this color singlet dipole. Before TD, the medium simply because it doesn't have enough resolution power cannot see these two objects. They're too close to each other. After a certain decoherence time these objects separate out in the transverse plane sufficiently so that the medium can see, it, see them. And of course, it follows also that uh, if you want the, the decoherence time can, can definitely be long, longer than the medium and that gives you, uh, whenever the decoherence time is of the order of the medium length L, then you'll have this minimal angle theta C uh, in, in the sense that any splitting occurring with angles smaller than theta C will actually never be resolved by the medium you will just basically have this uh, scenario that I was discussing before that the whole jet simply looks like it's one parton, although there are several splittings inside of it. It's simply that these splittings happen on small angles. And uh, <clears throat> this idea can be, can be promoted further to consider multiple radiation. And this comes exactly to the, the problem of counting the number of, of particles that are being uh, quenched by the medium. And it turns out that you can basically define this uh, on this plane of log uh, kT and log one over theta. So this is quite cryptic, but it basically is a way of representing this uh, these two divergences, one over theta and one over omega, or one over k perb, that uh, that we saw that the medium uh, that the vacuum jets have, right? These two collinear, soft and collinear divergences. And basically, we can divide it into a uh, in and out. Side and and the border is this blue border is, is is exactly the the border when the formation time of a certain splitting is of the order of the decoherence time. So any splitting with the formation time smaller than the decoherence time will basically fall into this red area, and they will happen 
as if the medium didn't exist, basically, because any uh, splitting with basically large scales will basically not be resolved by the medium because the medium has a finite resolution uh, scale. In terms of k perves, is basically square root of q hat omega. Uh, and that's this lower line here. And this uh, vertical line here is basically the, the angle of the smallest possible angle that can be resolved, which is theta c. And so basically, all these emissions inside of the cone, inside of this area, uh, inside of the cone, of course, of the jet, uh, they are basically not resolved by the medium. And they are giving exactly the number of partons that will be uh, quenched. And how many modes are those? Well, it's alpha s. And then we have this uh, more complicated logarithmic structure. But basically, the main log here is this log of pt. So it's basically log r over theta c and log pt over omega c. The omega c is basically the uh, hardest uh, mode in the medium. And you see that this probability is enhanced by a log, not a double log, but a single log of pt. Uh, so it still can be large and needs to be resumed. And um, so that we can do, and just now we can take the same idea of this sequencing uh, of this convolution of this uh, probability uh, distribution p. Um, we can take um, our initial jet spectrum and we can then take a, some sort of um, generalized uh, ex expression of a, of a fragmentation uh, from one single parton with the momentum p to a set of uh, n partons with momenta k1 to kn. And, um, and then we, we, we simply uh, take away, this is just a model, just an just just introduction of the topic. So you basically take away all, all of these partons that are being produced will lose a certain amount uh, epsilon. And in the end, we would like to balance the energy out in this uh, delta function. So all of the partons will lose an energy epsilon. And again, in the same limit of steeply falling spectra and small energy losses, again, the leading order term will simply be uh, 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 a Laplace transform of the probability distribution to the power n times the, the vacuum uh, exclusive spectra of, of n particles. So again, this is a leading order um, result and it can be systematically improvable, but um, it, uh, it, it gives us the possibility of studying multi-parton energy loss effects um, for now inclusive observables. And how can we do that? Is basically establishing a so-called generating functional uh, for that. So first, uh, the generating functional will contain two parts. One part uh, contain, uh, uh, pertains to the fragmentation inside of the medium, and the other part um, um, determines the fragmentation outside of the medium. And um, starting out outside of the medium, we simply have uh, this phase space uh, theta in now. So, so one minus theta in is, is the out phase space. And um, um, this is basically a vacuum ordered angular evolution. So this is, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it before, this is basically an evolu generalized evolution equation for any, co any distribution um, uh, following the, uh, uh, following the DigiLab evolutions, for instance, in, 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 the, in the vacuum. Right? So this is basically an angular order. In, in this case, it's angular ordered. Uh, and it's also constrained to live just in this green phase space, in this out phase space, outside of the medium. And this has to be coupled to um, this, this, the shower that lives inside of the medium. So the shower living inside of the medium is again a vacuum ordered shower that lives only in the phase space theta in. However, uh, it doesn't uh, simply go out into these, it doesn't end up with these test functions, which are the part measured particles inside of our jets, this U described by the U, but actually couples directly to this, to this Z out. It couples to the evolution outside. And, and the coupling between the inside evolution and the outside evolution comes with this additional quenching factor Q. So every time you produce a, 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 a gluon inside of the medium, it, you, you add to the, to the quenching of the jet another quenching factor coming exactly from the uh, quenching of that additional gluon. So for instance, in this plane, if you have an emission with a certain kt and theta, 
and then uh, you go out of the medium uh, and you can further radiate. It will basically be quenched as a total color charge of the jet plus this additional emission, this red emission here. Uh, there's another issue here, which, which I'll just go quickly. Uh, you basically, as you go out of the medium, you lose angular ordering, you lose coherence because the medium destroys all color correlations and, and you get this additional thing. Uh, so in the end, this generating functional is normalized, not to one, so it doesn't conserve probability, but it conserves, but it is, 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 is there is a probability loss or non-trivial normalization of the generating functional. Uh, and it gives you, if you put just u to one, all the test functions to one, it should give you uh, basically one. It should give you conservation of probability. In this case, it doesn't. It gives you actually uh, uh, an implicit equation for a new function called Q, which we call Q, because in the end, from this equation here, it's clear that it is um, um, a more generalized version of the quenching factor for a single part one. So this Q here, with PT inside of it. This is the quenching factor of a single parton. For every gluon that is produced inside a medium, you'll get, for instance, Q corresponding to a gluon, which is a Laplace transform of the probability of losing a certain amount of energy again. However, this nonlinear evolution equation that we have here, that we get directly from the generating function, tells us that, in fact, it's not only one gluon that is being quenched. This one gluon splits with the phase space and the probability of a Dijlak evolution and the phase space for the in-medium evolution into many, many gluons and that can split again into quarks, etc. And all of these additional emissions inside of this phase space will bring higher powers of Q into the game. So for instance, here in the plot, we have shown uh, a, a simple model for um, a quenching factor for a quark. And you see here that it also has an R dependent, but of course, of course, there is some certain cone uh, of the jet, and uh, as you open the cone, you will capture more and more energy, which means that the quenching factor will go up. Basically, this is the REA. So the bigger, the bigger the cone angle, the more energy you capture inside of your jet, and the the, the the less quenching you have. But this evolution basically tells you that if you open up the jet cone, you have more and more phase space for radiation. As we remember, the log of PT times R. You open up the phase space for radiation. And then you have more partons to quench. There's a higher multiplicity of partons that will lose energy. And the, your energy loss will be enhanced. And this is why these uh, full curves are suppressed compared to the dotted ones. These are the, the, the dotted curves are the bare quenching factors and the full curves are the recent quenching factors, Q, as we see in this evolution equation. And this gives us a sort of very interesting implication on the R dependence of the spectrum, as we can see in the end of the talk. So, and also the emerging probabilistic picture that is also a guide us to Monte Carlo's and uh, is that um, some of them have a similar picture to this, some of them have a very different picture, is that basically within a certain short time, you basically allow your jet to radiate as if it was completely in vacuum because the medium hasn't yet provided a big enough scale to actually resolve anything uh, at these high uh, KT emissions. As, as but in the middle intermediate stage, uh, there is of course, the medium resolves the, the partons that are being um, propagated through it and they will start radiating and they will start scattering and being modified. And then finally, as the jet goes out of the medium, you still have the possibility of having this late time, uh, late formation time radiation that will eventually lead to hydronization somewhere far out of the medium. So now let's go over to the details of how partons lose energy in the medium. And this we'll do in this, uh, introduce very briefly now this improved opacity expansion. So Typically, we have this, now, now I always refer to the medium scale as, as something that everybody should know, but of course, what we refer to as a medium scale is simply momentum broadening, roughly momentum broadening. So the medium's resolution power, or basically typical transverse momentum square that it can provide to any parton or any object moving through it, brief, roughly scales like a transport coefficient Q hat times the time of propagation. And with this, uh, you know, pocket formula, you can immediately understand why there is the separation between short formation times and some decoherence time. Because of course, at short times, 
the medium haven't yet, the, the momentum broadening haven't yet bro built itself up, right? There's of course a minimal time, and, which is the mean free path in the game here, but uh, that's, that's also a sm small, small correction to this picture. So basically these medium effects actually build up over time. And that's why there, are, there is this separation, both of space-time picture and of, and of, of momentum uh, basically picture. Uh, and basically this also tells you, us that the spectrum of gluons being induced by the medium, so the, the, the parton is being thrown around by momentum broadening, and then not only the parton, but also its virtual cloud of partons around it, uh, this uh, is being uh, stirred by, by medium interactions, and only when a sufficient k curve is, is, uh, is provided to the system, you can have a radiation. So one of these virtual objects, watching this virtual uh, kind of higher order fog states become actually real. And uh, that simply means that there is no collinear divergence. But on the other hand, there is a strong infrared divergence. And this is manifested in this famous spectrum omega di d omega, which contains three regimes basically at small energies when the formation time of these blue ones is of the order of the mean free path lambda, you will have a better height regime. Basically, you just resolve one uh, scattering center in the medium. And then there is this famous LPM regime where basically you will, between uh, the mean free path and the length of the medium, which is widely separated, in this regime, you will basically typically scatter of many, many uh, particles while you are being formed. While this gluon is being radiated, the system of the gluon and this emitter, emitter quark or emitter gluon is being scattered around many, many times. Uh, and then there is this final uh, high omega regime, which is when, when the formation time is uh, seemingly uh, larger than the length of the medium. It's not, uh, it cannot be, it has to be smaller than the length of the medium. But basically this regime, when basically the energy is above this maximal formation time, uh, sorry, the maximum energy, global energy, which sits in the numerator of the square root here, q hat l squared, uh, then, you, um, then you are scattering, again, uh, effectively hard of a, of a single scattering center. This is the GLV, or n equals to 1 um, uh, regime. Now, in the intermediate point, there is a very interesting and important regime which was discussed um, in the context of uh, turbulence and, and thermalization in the medium. Uh, by, by these gentlemen here. And this is uh, a scale that again applies to large media. And this is basically at this scale, which is roughly goes like alpha s squared of q hat l squared. At this point, basically you cannot anymore talk about single global emission, but you have to talk about the full spectrum of, of a full uh, cascade of medium induced emissions and their rapid uh, and turbulent thermalization. And we will come back to this importance of this scale uh, later. Uh, I will not go into the details, but but here you can also make out parametrically that uh, high energy gluons, high energy emissions, medium induced emissions, will basically occupy small angles and be within the cone, and they, they, they do not contribute to jet to to jet energy loss because they live inside the, they, they they are emitted at small angles and broadened to small angles, and there also is this uh, radi this, this more important um, uh, regime, which is exactly this, uh, when the gluon energies are close to the omega s, th this alpha s squared times q at l squared, where you have multiple emissions and you have large angle emissions. Um, so that's the main driver of jet energy loss. Again, I will not go into the details here, just to, to tell you that actually the, the, the formal, uh, the foundations of the computing this spectrum is, are well known and being established since the 90s. It's by Bayer, Dockshitzer, Muller, Penny and Schiff, and Zaharov, independently. Um, and they are well known and, and, uh, and basically they, con they, they correspond to uh, a realization that actually at, uh, on the light cone, any part that moves on the light cone, this transverse uh, momentum broadening induced by the medium actually leads to quantum mechanics, a 2D quantum mechanical problem. So you basically have the time or light cone time direction is basically uh, simply the time and the dynamics in the transverse plane is given by basically a potential, it's dominated by potential and kinetic time. Uh, and in this picture here, the two upper partons, are, this is basically part of a cross section these two upper partons live on the on the amplitude side. Uh, they correspond, for instance, to an emitting uh, quark or emitting gluon and this emitted gluon upstairs. 
And then this uh, guy downstairs is, is again uh, living on the complex conjugate amplitude side. And it's, for instance, the, the, the original quark or, um, or original emitter. And so the, the potential that, that actually uh, drives this quantum mechanical problem, this, this like diffusion in the transverse plane, is uh, basically given by the elastic interactions with the medium, the sigma L. And this approximately can, goes like uh, x squared. So basically, the smaller the smaller the distance between these partons, these pair of partons, pairs of partons, uh, the the smaller the interaction, the smaller the, the broadening of these uh, guys. Because again, uh, color uh, 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 color transparency. Basically, you have that these partons disappear <laughs> because they are so close to each other. Uh, typically. Um, this system, this, this equation, this K, uh, was solved using uh, the opacity expansion, which was first introduced by Wiedemann and also by Gulashi and by Vita. So basically, you, you say that you simply resum the many, many scatterings. Okay, first, you have a vacuum term. There's a vacuum evolution. There's no medium effect. That automatically is canceled here in this difference. And the first term is basically a medium, a vacuum evolution, you scatter once and then you have a vacuum evolution. And then higher order terms is, is analogous and comp uh, computed. So this is the so-called famous opacity expansion that has been driven. In another way, you can uh, do uh, what I wrote here, actually, you can just take this potential and you just uh, forget about this log and you have that the potential is x squared. And in that case, the evolution equation is a Schrodinger equation for a harmonic oscillator, which is a, has a path integral solution, and you can solve it analytically, and that is called the harmonic oscillator approximation, which is also mainly employed by Bayer, Dokshitzer, Müller, Pernier-Schiff, and Zaharov, so the so-called BDMPS Z uh, thing. However, as we say here clearly, that their um, their um, their uh, formalism extends to to all orders in the past. What we are doing uh, in the improved opacity expansion is to resolve one hard splitting on top of many soft splitting. So basically, you expand your problem around the harmonic oscillator solution, and you add a number of hard splittings. And you have to carefully define what is the number of hard splitting. So for instance, here, uh, you, can, you can basically forget about the details of these, these, these uh, guys here, these two formulas. But what you do is that you take this log uh, which is depending on depends on one over x squared, which gives you a problem because it's uh, it's not anymore a harmonic oscillator. You 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 fix a, a separa separation scale q, a large separation scale q, which is much bigger than a typical momentum transfer mu in e splitting, and then you you basically have a, a constant term here, x squared times a constant. And this you treat in the harmonic oscillator uh, approximation, and the other one. This term here, x squared log of one over x, is what you treat perturbatively, which turns out to be an expansion. And simply, uh, you have the emission process of the screw one with omega in terms of many, many soft scatterings. And then you have the same uh, with one single hard scattering, etc. This is the way you separate out hard and soft scatterings. So I won't go into the details here of, of how we do it. Um, it's just to give you a flavor um, that, that in principle, this uh, way of treating the radiation gives us a nice interpolation between different regimes, especially the multiple scattering regime of LPM, which is typically described in the harmonic oscillator approximation and this hard tail at the end, which is described typically in this N equals to one approximation. Uh, and this, this is the main information here that we have a very precise and and knowledge of the spectrum and also of the rate in case we want to use that. We can also compute the ID omega dt, which uh, seems to actually work pretty well compared to, to Amy, uh, the improved Amy code, which we compared to down here in the Solinar paper. Uh, and the most important thing is that, in fact, in the soft limit, when you have soft emissions, omega smaller than omega c, uh, you can show, as was shown by, by Joao and, and Yassine in this paper, that you basically get an effective Q hat. And the most important thing about the effective Q hat, this is the famous BDMPS formula, square root of Q hat over omega, is the rate for the rate. Uh, time, uh, where this effective Q hat actually 
explicitly has a bare q hat q at zero times the log. So the log here is extremely exp uh, important. And then higher order correction to this log uh, basically goes like one over log uh, in terms like powers of one over log. And so in the end, um, you see that this is uh, this is um, this is uh, somehow bringing into the game a, a significant logarithmic contributions from hard scatterings to the bare q hats. And just to note the to the phenomenology that that you shouldn't just do a normal bare q hat and expect that you should also include, which is very very important, the logs of q hat. If you do that consistently, uh, you will see a large effect from this log. And also an important thing here is that mention is that this new star here allows to uh, match different, uh, also by draw and yeah, seen here, the new star is a simple way of simply merging the description of different medium models. You have to compute the mu star for your favorite medium model, for instance, the Gulashi one potential, which is this uh, you know, device screen, the potential, or you have a full HTL potential, something like that. If you manage to do your expansion and you find your mu square, the matching scale, you can basically compare all these media models on the same, uh, on, the, on the apples to apples comparison of these models. Now, what we are interested in is basically emissions, not just off a single parton, which is that the I, the omega spectrum is all about, is basically also saying that these partons that are being emitted away uh, being emitted, you, they also have to drift away or being emitted away from the jet cone. And uh, then we also need to treat broadening and now we, we just put out the paper on the broadening and we basically <laughs> rederived the formula from Molière from 1948, <laughs> um, which is very, uh, not very known in our community, although it's, it's used in other communities, I think. But it basically interpolates between this uh, Gaussian broadening at small angles or small k perps and uh, a power law, one of the capers to the fourth, uh, higher twist correction at, at large k per. Uh, and in the end, what we, what we need is basically convolve this, um, of course, what we would optimally need is the, uh, the fully differential spectrum of what we now will assume for out of cone emissions is that you basically have a rate of producing these blue ones and then you have, you basically have a broadening factor out of the cone. And this is basically what lies be, be behind these uh, these um, these uh, curves um, that I showed before, uh, and I won't. I don't think I will go into the more more details of this guy here. So now let's go to the um, phenomenological application uh, applications of of the um, um, of what I've been discussing quickly. Uh, Hopefully, understandably. So, what we would like to apply all these physics of merging of, of uh, hard and uh, hard scales of the jet and, and of the medium, and of the um, of the different uh, dynamics of how the, the, the partons interact with the medium, to a concrete uh, observable, which is the constant the, the, the jet spectrum in heavy ion collisions, and especially uh, given at a given cone size. So, the general picture is is that we, we've been discussing so far is that. You have all these partons, you have to resolve, you have to guess somehow or do your best uh, educated guess or calculation of how many of these partons actually contribute to a certain energy delta E being actually produ produced uh, out of the jet cone, transported out of the jet cone. That's right. If you have fewer color sources, uh, you will have less, less energy lost. Um, however, since that, that's when you have a small cone size, right? you have fewer color sources because the jet basically uh, doesn't have a lot of phase space to, to fragment, and so you have less energy lost. But then again, you have a smaller collection radius, and so it's easier for you, uh, easier for the energy to actually flow out of the cone. Right? Because the jet is small, it's easier, the part on it emits a, a general gluon and this gluon is easily uh, transported out of the cone. If you have a big cone, you have the opposite dynamics. You have more um, color sources. You have a larger range. You see here that there is this additional green branch of the jet. You have more color sources, which will lead to more uh, sources of energy loss, both elastic and inelastic. Uh, that will lead to a bigger energy loss. 
However, on the other hand, you open up the cone and you can collect more of the cone. And in fact, uh, you can collect more of the energy that is being lost. And in fact, you can also capture some of the energy from the underlying event. Okay, just in, exactly as in, in the case for the vacuum in one of my first slides, we can actually have a positive contribution simply from capturing some of the soft stuff in the the jet population between these two guys here are, are quite different. So you can have, so in other words, the, the characteristics, the spectra of all these different shapes of the jets that you can imagine are different. We have to be very careful and we have to treat this consistently. So how do we do that is we say that, well, we again treat the spectrum as steeply falling. And in the end, our nucleus nucleus spectrum, sigma AA is schematically a moment F jet. Uh, so it's basically a, medium modified version of that microjet spectrum, okay, uh, times a hard cross section. So the hard cross section produces your part on the scale of PT and R, zero. So R zero is a big angle of the order of one. So the scale is PT. And then you have this fragmentation into a microjet that lives on angular scale R, right? And in the back medium, in the, sorry, in the medium, you will have that this contains the, the vacuum fragmentation of a certain part on K to a certain part on I. And then this part on I will basically uh, source a uh, certain medium induced uh, quenching factor Q. So basically, this is basically this two stage process. You have remissions out of the cone, which is given by this first factor here. And then you have this, this, this uh, resummed quenching factor Q coming from all those other modes living inside of the jet that, that are being resolved by the medium, right? And this happens both for when you can produce a quark and when you produce a gluon. Um, and the, the moment of the spectrum is basically given by, by, by Xn. So this is basically the uh, somehow Mellon moment of the spectrum like this. And we know that these objects here, they follow, uh, at least in the vacuum, they follow uh, this uh, famous DG lab evolution equation with the anomalous dimensions. So what we do concretely is that we take the spectrum um, from a leading order from Pythia using uh, EPS09 and PDF. So this is, uh, this is important. And then we also do this, actually this log one over our estimation, we could do it using the digital lab evolution equations, but we actually use it directly from Pythia. So we basically compute uh, the jet spectrum at a given R in the vacuum. And then these quenching factors, we, we basically populate the, the uh, transverse, uh, uh, the, the, the plane of collision, uh, we populate it. So we, we, we sample a jet production point, we sample a jet trajectory, and we put it through event by event, event by event, we put it through hydrodynamic, uh, hydrodynamic background given by Vishnu, uh, the Vishnu code, the Vishnu hydrodynamic code. And in that way, we, we sample on event by event basis um, the uh, local Q hat parameters, local also elastic energy loss, E hat, and things like this, the local temperature basically and the path length. And so the initial condition to this, uh, this evolution of the Q, so the, 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 the F here uh, is the vacuum evolution outside of the jet cone is given by Pythia or by the digital lab evolution equations and the evolution, case, uh, evolution equations for Q have, we have discussed them already. And the initial uh, condition of these two evolution uh, for these evolution equations is basically how a single parton will lose energy. And this is modeled again, as we said before, above this, uh, this scale omega s of turbulent uh, thermalization, you have just emissions of single gluons and their broadening, which is this factor here, which is what we mostly have been discussed um, in the second section or third section of my talk. And then below this turbulent uh, scale, we also include a certain um, and down to the temperature, we allow for the recovery of energy simply because all the energy that is being dumped into these modes immediately thermalize or quasi immediately, quasi instantaneously thermalize in the medium and their energy will basically be spread out uh, over, over the whole solid angle. And therefore there is this recovery angle R that, that helps us understand how much of the uh, energy actually is being recovered. And the same thing goes for the elastic energy loss, which is basically given in the second, third line here, it goes with proportion to E hat uh, times L. And then again, um, the energy that's being lost is being smeared out and recovered by this recovery angle. So in the other words, we have in the perturbative sector, one only one parameter, which is G med. So temperature and everything is sampled from the medium and path lengths. And there's only one parameter, which is the 
coupling of the jet to the medium or, or the fast part of the medium, GMAD. Um, so yes. And in a non-perturbative sector, we have two modeling parameters. We can match, we can, we can, we can choose this modeling parameter omega s. Uh, and so we, we varied it and also this recovery angle R. Uh, and we basically numerically confirm that within good estimations, they, 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 they don't really matter much. So we can come back to that. So these are our results now for our, the full quark and gluon quenching factor. So this is basically uh, a single part quark or single gluon being emitted into the plasma and they basically branch out and lose energy. They will lead to these uh, fra uh, these uh, these REAs basically different R's, and again we see this this effect that 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 large PT the phase space for for emitting many many gluons opens up, and uh, the suppression uh, is quite universal at high angles. Also because we start recollecting the energy, so there is a, there, there is this dynamic going back and forth. However, when you put all of these together, um, and now I'm coming to the last slide of my my talk to the then we we see that the um, quark and gluon, putting the quark and gluon fractions together, we see that the RA that we get uh, describes the centrality dependence of uh, R equals to 0.4 jets very well. So here we have found that the, the GMAD is roughly of the order of two. So, um, and of course the high precision data of ATLAS really pins down now. It's, if it's G2.1 or G2.2, it's really a matter here, it makes a difference. In these curves, and so so we are still working on on on, on finding the best uh, to to fitting the data here uh, best to the to the existing experiment data. And the second thing is that the R dependence of the jet. So here we plot the RA uh, of jets uh, with the cone size R versus the RA of jets of points of cone size one is gives gives something like this. It's quite universal and stable at high PT and has this deviations and low PT. And at least at high PT, the, the trend is very consistent with the recent CMS data, which is still preliminary. Um, so we still are, are, are polishing the last details and, and, and we, we're still working uh, to finalize our interpretation. But, but just to give you a flavor that putting all these ingredients together really gives you also this important um, uh, trait, which is this flattening of the, of the REA at high PT. It looks like the JIT REA is basically completely flat up to very high PT. So sorry for going uh, slightly above time. Uh, I just want to have an outlook that um, advances in the theory of jet quenching and in the theory in this kind of intermediate hard uh, regime of jet quenching allows for precision, for, for going into a precision era uh, in jet quenching physics. Uh, and we are looking forward to extending that, uh, that program. Um, now, the perturbative merging of vacuum plus these in-medium uh, hard emissions is, um, is very important. Uh, and on, on that side, and, and also, on, also from the previous point, they, the modeling of the ultra soft sector, uh, so basically related to these thermalized modes and things like this, this needs to be further explored and, and improved. And there we can learn a lot from, from other people and, and, and improve that. And, and, and basically use jets as a measure of thermalization. And finally, Q-hat is a measure of both the amount of energy lost and the resolution properties of the medium due to color coherence. That's one of the main messages here is that basically tells you how many partons should be quenched and how hard they are quenched. And therefore, we have uh, basically shown that the, the R dependence of these jets uh, spectra are, they're very rich observables to probe different regimes uh, and this is still to be uh, to be completely um, used, taking advantage of. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Conrad. It was a very fascinating talk. <laughs> Sorry for this delay. <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, uh, it's perfectly on time actually, and uh, we have we can now take questions. So please ask questions. Ah, please, Soren. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Conrad. Thanks for this very elegant talk. Um, I had a question on, on exactly how you, um, uh, so maybe you can just explain this a little bit more because you, because you were a little bit fast there. Um, mm -hmm. How exactly you get your, your energy lost out of the cone, right? To, mm -hmm. to including these elastic processes then. Right, right. So, so since, since we are working in this Laplace space, so since we have a steeply falling spectrum, this is a bias effect. Um, 
and we really we really we leverage this uh, fact that that um, that the spectrum is uh, now it's in the beginning probably um, here that that we can basically uh, write out that the medium spectrum is proportional to the vacuum spectrum times a quenching factor, mm -hmm. and in this Laplace space, all contributions to p whether they are radiative or elastic or maybe some other um, mechanism absorptive or something like that, they basically become factorized as, as a, in, in a sense of a multi multiplicative, right? So you basically will have a quenching factor for radiative processes or a quenching factor for elastic processes and everything like that. And the second step is to realize that, you're, that that's just the initial condition for one single parton, but your jet has many partons. And so you simply have to iterate these elastic and, and radiative uh, full quenching factors through many, many partons. And that's the second part of the, of the step. Yeah, I was more, sorry, maybe I didn't phrase this precisely enough, right? Because so, no. so, so I mean, the, so, so the medium, in, uh, so in principle, the formulas for the medium induced radiations that you, at least that you showed, right? They're integrated mm -hmm. over angle and the angle is parametrically small, although it's actually kind of large, right? Yeah. Um, and then you have to decide how it exactly. This was the slide. How uh, how how it eventually the soft glue and you radiate it goes out of the cone or not, right? Yeah. Uh, so 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 yeah. So actually, this this was kind of the stuff I was asking for more explanation. Oh sorry. For. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, we are. Uh, so the, ultimately, we would like to have something. What you have basically is the is the full uh, exploration of of. Uh, Something more, more, more um, complete in the sense of that we follow, we track every gluon that is being emitted, their broadening, so their elastic interactions, and their uh, and their further splitting up to large angles, so that we can exactly trace the amount of gluons, amount of energy being being going out of the certain cone. Um, so to that uh, effect, we should we should um, definitely and that 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 effect will be important in this regime where where you have multiple gluon radiation and, and, and splitting. Uh, however, what we, uh, we see is that the main, the main effect can be captured just by assuming that you emit a certain amount of gluons and then they will be broadened uh, by this, by this and, and this can be approximated again by this simple ansatz here, that you basically have the production uh, of a certain gluon with energy omega and then the probability that actually that gluon broadens out to a large angle. Okay, so, so it's kind of like a factorized, you produce the gluon and then you have elastic scatterings which drive it out of the cone according to that essentially exactly. elastic scattering probability that you have, right? Yes, and, and that's roughly what how the BDMP spectrum, the fully differential BDMP spectrum looks yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's also roughly what I would expect. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But uh, we, we, we really would like to improve this, this, this uh, especially this, this turbulent uh, sector, right? Where actually the energy goes out and then it thermalizes and then we actually can come back in some yeah. smear. Yeah, I mean, as you know, we're looking at this too, so yeah. <laughs> maybe we we'll can yeah. get together on this at some point. Yeah. Right, right. So, I mean, one, one of the things we checked is how sensitive are we to this recovery angle R? Uh, and how sensitive are we to this um, onset of this turbulence regime omega S? And we saw that it's relatively, the RAA as an observable itself is not so sensitive. So perhaps we can find other observables which are much more sensitive um, but, but yeah, for the for the jet spectrum, it was it was pretty robust. That's the okay. message. Yeah. So actually, I have a follow up question. So yeah. uh, I think uh, so. If it depends, actually, the cone size will depend in a sensitive way on what you call. Uh, I mean, how much of the soft part you're emit, uh, you're leaving out, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then regarding this soft part. Uh, uh, there is also, I don't know how you could just char characterize it by just two parameters, because if you go into like strong coupling approaches, for example, ads cf to like approaches, mm -hmm. then the radiation would be rather thought of as like you have some string in the ads and that leads to some source and that radiates gravitons. And that can be understood as a, I think uh, there's a paper by Edmond and, uh, uh, and Al Mueller on this, and uh, so mm -hmm. it, it looks like the wide angle emission, at least the uh, mm -hmm. substantial wide angle emissions are a bit different from strong coupling versus weak coupling. And also uh, you could also have to probably take into account the back reaction on the medium also. Right. So, uh, so perhaps uh, uh, 
maybe if you put a sufficiently high cutoff for to leave out the soft part you may not you can perhaps characterize by only two parameters but rather i mean this it looks like it could be more complicated right depending on definitely yeah yeah this this sector is uh, is, uh, is 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 complicated um so what we which what we basically um assumed is this exactly this so whether we don't assume anything about how this particles thermalize or how fast in principle we just say that they 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 all these quanta emitted uh, induced below this this scale omega s are basically uh, spread out and then you have this and are, are just weakly uh, correlated with the direction of the jets right I'm, I'm sure you can do this better um, and what we used here for the, for instance the recovery angle actually is also some recent study from the hybrid model where they have a linearized uh, version of the uh, uh, which the paper came out just a couple of days ago um, where they have a kind of linearized version of the hydrodynamics and they see how much of the this wake or this yeah kind of medium response actually enters back into the jet and um, it's roughly we were, so we are trying to kind of parameterize it within reasonable uh, parameters but uh, yes I'm, I'm definitely uh, also if you would look at other observables for instance the jet shape or some on some details of the distribution of the gluons at, at these large angles definitely you will see much more sensitivity I'm sure but for our purposes this is kind of the simplest most economical way we can get away with it okay thanks I have another question if I may sure sure um, so, so, so this is really with regards to the to the radiation pattern in this kind of nice uh, probabilistic picture that you described, Conrad. So, mm -hmm. um, so, the, so the way I understand your picture is essentially that you have these vacuum-like emissions, and at some point they get resolved in the medium, right? Yes. So, what I would, what I would, so, so based on that picture, I would think that okay, that the pattern that they then emit medium-induced radiation essentially comes from starting at the decoherence time, right? So when they become separated and then going all the way out to L. So my question was is essentially whether you account for that or whether you kind of in the rates that you use inside the medium, you sort of just set the decoherence time to zero then always. Yes, yes, we set the decoherence time to zero. That's true. Mm -hmm. So if you would have a Monte Carlo, which is... Uh, uh, something we are working on, and also what what um, Edmond and uh, Paul Kokal and these guys are working on. You could, in principle, um, keep track of the space time there, and you will have some corrections. Yeah, for sure. Do you have a Do you have an idea whether this is this is going to be a, a big effect or not? So one thing that we checked is that we we varied this. Um, uh, this phase space here, um, this parameter theta c. So you can. Think about it in different ways, but one way is to simply compute this phase space here in a more, uh, let's say to next, this is basically a double log approximation. So we can compute it to a higher order approximation. Um, and, and we see that theta c is pretty sensitive to theta c. So yes, I guess these kind of fluctuations could play a, could play a role in the final parameter. Although perhaps, yeah, I mean, I guess if, you, if you're worried about out of cone loss, right, then you're then you're mostly dealing with more soft radiation, right? I mean, I guess a lot of the radiation patterns that right. at least go into this omega s, they're effectively infinite medium radiation, right? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of wondering whether the, so, to, so the L, I mean, at the scale omega s, right? The L essentially yeah. plays no role, right? Right, 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 exactly. So, so there, are, there are these, uh, yeah, yeah. We can we can discuss maybe more, but another thing is to uh, all these runnings of, of Q hat uh, is is also like we do in our spectrum here is also basically the, the dominant uh, mode here will be Q hat L, yeah, which is the largest one, um, Q hat L square basically. Yeah. yeah. So so whether whether you have a small correction to that, that will basically be a sub leading in the log and blah blah blah. So yeah. Um, okay. I see. Thanks. But I think some details would, would probably, yeah. I mean, it's exciting to, to really point out that the, the experimental data is so, gets so, starts to get so precise that actually we can start tracing this, these things here. I mean, the Atlas data is very precise, right? So they, I mean, if we want to really get it spot on, we really maybe would have to do a little bit better. Yeah, I'm not sure. We still haven't uh, landed on the final parameters. <laughs>
I would have another question if I may. If this would be my last. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Uh, can you do? Can you can, can you do jet shapes too? So like distribution of R and of R and Z of, of stuff inside jets, or would this be? Would you would you need major major reworks to this framework actually? Well, so um, that's in the in the pipeline. Um, we in this in this. Uh, in this quenching factor approximation, let's say it like that, in this Laplace space, as, as I, sh I showed you the, the, the full generating functional, right? So the generating function basically is, uh, is um, from this taking a, a functional derivative of this object, you can get the single particle inclusive and uh, also uh, two particle inclusive dis distributions. Um, and uh, so we were working on that. Uh, but there you also have issues where with maybe hydronization and hydronization maybe inside of the medium. So what we what we are planning is basically uh, something also what 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 the group of Edmund was also so proposing a uh, kind of small jet uh, <laughs> fragmentation function, mi micro jet fragmentation function. Yeah, and that's uh, something we can immediately do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that's essentially like adding another dimension to the plot that you have on the right, right? Where. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. To just a, a, a jet fragment. Uh, yeah. Fragmentation. yeah. Okay, so super. Um, thanks, Conrad, then, for this yeah. great talk again. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation.